Good afternoon. I'm Carlin Bowman, and I'm a senior fellow at AEI, and I'd like to welcome all of you and our C-SPAN audience to the final installment of our 2020 Election Watch program. I thought about beginning the session today with, with very quick introductions of our panelists, including my dear colleagues, Nora Mornstein and Michael Barone from AEI, John Fortier from Bipartisan Policy Center, and Henry Olson from the Ethics and Public Policy Center. But I thought I should say a word about the polls. As many of you know, I've been watching the polls for 40 years at AEI. I think polls can tell you a great deal about a complex country. I don't think they should ever be used to make policy. They're too blunt for that purpose, nor do I think that they're particularly well suited to election predictions. That said, we have a lot of accounting to do for what went wrong with the polls in this election campaign. And I'm hopeful that the polling profession will be as they did in 2016 to look carefully at what went wrong and what things could be done better in the future. I don't know at this point whether polling has, political polling has a future. One of the Republican pollsters said after the election campaign, and I'm quoting directly, the political polling profession is done. This is devastating for my industry. Um, what, what future the polls have remains to be seen, but I think the polling profession will take the errors very seriously. Now let's get started. We're going to start with John Fortier today. John, where are we and what are the legal challenges? Thanks, Carlin. Um, so let me start just reminding everybody what we've all been watching is just a, a huge increase in uh, voting by mail, voting early, and what we don't know the final numbers are, just a general increase in voter turnout. Uh, rough numbers, uh, about 101 million people voted before election day, of 65 million or so, uh, by mail, and that some are coming in, that may go up, uh, another 36 or so in person. And that might end up being something like uh, 50, 47% uh, uh, of, of people voting, uh, I'm sorry, a little bit over 40% of people voting uh, by mail, a little bit over 20% of people voting in person, and just a smaller fraction in the 30s voting uh, in person on election day. Now that's a sea change from even the the high point that we'd seen in 2016, where about 41% of people voted before election day. So we saw a lot of that. Uh, second, you know, we have a, a bunch of places that we are waiting on, and we have some, some results that haven't been called. Uh, you know that I've been one who said we could certainly know the result on election night, and I, I suppose I could have a mea culpa here, but I, I do think uh, it, I always said it depended on the margins, and this election uh, was closer, both closer overall, although I think the popular vote number is going to continue to go up for Joe Biden, um, but also close in, in a number of states. And so we see a number of states where it is close enough that we haven't called it. Uh, most of the outstanding ballots and counting is actually going to be done in places that are not competitive in California, in New York, New Jersey, uh, Illinois. So again, a lot of the ballots are out there uh, and will come in slowly. But again, they're in, in places that don't matter so much. I guess we're watching, of course, uh, because Donald Trump has some paths to the presidency, but they're narrower. And so we're watching several states. If, if those states tip to Joe Biden, even though we don't know the final results, we, we will know the winner of the presidency. Uh, but if they don't, we'll, we'll go on. And so Georgia has been narrowing. I think that's a reasonable chance that we'll still end up either not knowing and going to a recount, uh, but, but not having a Biden call, but we'll see. Uh, some of Atlanta has come in, we'll see what's left. Uh, Pennsylvania, I think is the one out there that we always worried about and they, they have a fair amount of the ballot out there. They're counting, uh, those numbers look generally good for Joe Biden, they're coming from democratic places. If Joe Biden were to overtake Donald Trump, uh, he is behind now, uh, that would pretty much end Donald Trump's chances of winning. Uh, and then in Arizona and Nevada, where uh, Trump hopes that some of the vote coming in will benefit him. Some of the early batches did, some of the later batches did not. Uh, so we'll see what happens. But you know, I think again, if we get a call in a, in a Pennsylvania, especially, or in an Arizona, you know, th then we know it will likely be over. And we may know, you know late tonight, or we may know tomorrow, or we may wait another day. If everything ends up being super close, of course, we're going on for, for quite a while. John, tell us a little bit about how recounts work. Well, of course, we have the process of just counting first and then canvassing and getting an official certified result. That varies from state to state. Uh, some states will do it within a week. States like California will take over 30 days to do it. Uh, if we do get to a point where there's a certified result and we are 
close, uh, and that varies from state to state what close means, uh, we're, we might have a recount. Recounts tend to be pretty boring. They tend to be simply just looking at the ballots again, maybe putting them through the machines again, not dealing with some of the other issues on the side that would be dealt with with legal challenges. So the recount, and there's some talk of a recount being called for in, in Wisconsin. Uh, we saw a recount Jill Stein called for in Wisconsin back in 2016. That itself is unlikely to change things. So I think the question is, do we end up in a place where we're very close in some key states that make the difference? Um, the recount probably won't change much, but the, but the, the legal challenges and the, the fighting over the last ballot, if we're down to hundreds or maybe low thousands in those states, that will matter. If we're bigger than that, I think we're just gonna know the result at some point and there will be a concession and we'll, we'll have a president elect. How long do recounts usually take, John? Again, they vary um, and they can start earlier or later. So some states that certify early could be starting next week. Um, some of them give themselves a lot of time to do this. Some of the recount laws are samples at first and then larger amounts if, if uh, needed. So again, they vary. They could take just a few days if, if it's a simple straight out recount, just running the ballots through again. It could take you know, a week or 10 days. A lot of states will give themselves that much. And then there are all the legal contests, which are not necessarily done after the recount. Sometimes they're done in parallel. So it will vary. Uh, again, if we're very, very close in these states, uh, we, 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 um, you know, we, may, we may go further. Just one thing to note in Georgia, perhaps we'll have a recount um, but perhaps for the president, but perhaps we'll also have a recount to see if uh, David Perdue has made the 50% mark and, and avoids a runoff. Right now, he's dropped a little bit below that. If it is that close, you know, we may have a recount just for that purpose to, to determine whether he's above or below the line. I should point out that John is the editor of the fourth edition of After the People Vote. This is the only primer you'll ever need on what happens after we vote. And so that's a very valuable book at this particular time and you can find it on the AI website. John, was there any evidence of outside election interference? And there, we didn't seem to hear much about voter impediments. It seemed to go very smoothly. Well, on, on interference, of course, there always is something. We, we saw some little incidents. If you remember the, the sort of misinformation that came that the administration uh, identified as coming from the Iranian government. Uh, there are governments trying to put out misinformation and to get into some systems, to get into registration systems, not evidence that it happened in a significant way. I think we're in a much better place than we were in 2016. Were there impediments? Um, Yes, I mean, it depends on what you mean by impediments, but there were all sorts of changes to our electoral system. There were all sorts of challenges. States made you know, dramatic changes. And so there were some issues. I, the, the, you know, uh, the big picture I think is we, we turned around our election. We ran it in a very different way. We had very high turnout. Many people voted very early. So I, I think we can tell a pretty good story of how we ran this election. But of course there were issues and in looking back at what happened, states are going to consider what to what to do in, in reforming for the future. John, what do you think the future of voting by mail will be? Are we going to give up the civic ritual of going to the polls in person? I don't think so, but you know, this jump up is tremendous. It's from you know 23 or 4 percent to over 40 percent of people voting by mail, and some states you know, much higher numbers. Um, I, I think some states will will likely just keep the system, or at least keep major parts of it. Uh, Interestingly, the, the, the West, of course, voted a lot by mail before this election. A number of the more traditional states were Democratic-leaning uh, Eastern states. And you know, some of them, I think, have moved in a way. New Jersey moved to essentially voting almost all by mail, a dramatic change. They're probably likely to retain that. Now, that being said, there's, there's still a lot of early voting out there. Uh, there are states like Texas who still do lots of that, had record turnout. States like Florida, which do a, a mix of early in-person and voting by mail. So I think you'll see uh, a lot of variety, but certainly in the democratic states, you'll, you'll continue to see lots of voting by mail. Some people will want to continue to do it. If I had a guess, I think maybe we'll see a, a slight slipping back of the people, percentage of people who vote by mail, but not much. We'll, we're, we're going to set a much higher bar for the future with, with people going forward and, and many fewer states that rely just on election day. John, in our last few sessions, you looked very carefully at the governor's races. There weren't many of them this time, only 11. Were there any surprises? Oh, not surprises so much, but one, one flip in, in Montana, uh, Greg Gianforte is, is now the governor, one, one maybe by a larger margin than some people would have thought, but there was one flip, uh, not, a, not a very exciting governor's class this year. 
And what about 2022? Have you looked ahead at those races yet? Yeah, 2022 is uh, the big year uh, of governors. That's it's where you have many, many more up. And you know, I will note uh, they will they like the Senate elections. They may be affected by who's in the White House. And so, if Joe Biden is in the White House, you know, I think the Republicans will have interesting targets, especially in some of those key Midwestern states where you'll have an open seat in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, you'll have uh, incumbents running for re-election in in Michigan and and Wisconsin. So, you know, I do think it's possible that a Biden presidency plus a pretty big year in governorships will lead to some increase in the, in the in GOP governorships uh, in that cycle. John, something you also followed for us were the state legislative races and trifectas, uh, joint control, which is so important in redistricting. What happened? I think here there were some surprises. Yes, Democrats, I think, were, were hopeful that they would take some, uh, some state chambers, especially in some, some bigger Republican states, uh, and, you know, in general, as the Democratic wave did not materialize in the way that, that some had hoped, you know, those, those gains did not happen. Uh, in fact, you saw some gains in the other direction uh, in New Hampshire, um, Republicans uh, keeping Democrats from getting the, the uh, trifecta we think in Minnesota, maybe not officially called, but it looks like they're going to maintain divided control there. Uh, Arizona is uncalled. But a uh, number of places where Democrats were hoping for things, places like Texas, uh, which which didn't happen. And when you go forward to redistricting, I think you're going to see Republicans are not going to have the same advantage they had in 2010. They really had quite an overwhelming advantage in many, many states. But they are going to be in control in states like Texas and Florida uh, and Georgia and North Carolina, where the legislature has, has a role, but the governor doesn't. Um, not in the Midwest, but they'll be in divided places in the Midwestern states. So again, I think if you looked at the map and thought who has a bigger advantage in redistricting, probably it is Republicans going forward. Thank you very much, John. And now we'll turn to Norm Ornstein. Uh, Norm, let's start with the scenario that you and John talked a little bit about last night. We were emailing about it. We don't get to talk very often about faithless electors. Um, this is, seems to be an unlikely scenario, but could you explain what we were talking about last night? Sure. So. We have, as uh, John suggested, multiple paths here for uh, what will happen with the electoral votes in the remaining states. But one plausible path is where Joe Biden would end up with 270 electoral votes, the exact number needed to win the presidency, with Donald Trump at 268. Now, the Supreme Court heard a case just a few months ago, uh, they ruled on it, on faithless electors. And that, of course, is whether somebody who is pledged to be an elector to a presidential candidate goes to vote, uh, what this year should be, December 14th, and votes for somebody else. Uh, the Supreme Court said that states could uh, mandate uh, that that could not happen or punish those who did uh, basically uh, violate their faith. Uh, but what we know is this a number of states actually have ironclad rules in place in their laws. If somebody votes for uh, a candidate other than the one to whom they are pledged, they will be immediately removed and replaced with somebody who will cast the appropriate vote. But a whole lot of states don't have those. And generally speaking, if there are penalties, they're pretty modest civil ones. We had a, a faithless elector in Oregon a few years ago uh, who had to pay a $1,000 misdemeanor fine. Uh, which doesn't mean a whole lot. So if we ended up right at 270 to 268, there are going to be serious questions about uh, whether one of the electors for Joe Biden in this case voted. It doesn't have to be for Donald Trump. It could be for anybody else. And we would end up at 269, 269, nobody getting over the 270 needed to win the presidency. And under the Constitution, that would mean that on January 6th, the new Congress, the House of Representatives would vote for a president by state. Uh, that the requirement is 26 states uh, that uh, would cast those votes to select a president. And if we assume that uh, the votes, there would be no faithless members of Congress, that they would vote their party, the Republicans who started before this election with 26 of the uh, 50 state delegations, Democrats having 22 and the rest evenly split. Now we're gonna have at least the 26. Democrats have been hopeful, I think, that they might be able to switch 
Montana, the one uh, member there who was a Republican, they were not successful there, that they might be able to do it in Alaska, where the one incumbent, Don Young, appears on a path to victory. And Republicans may well have switched a couple more delegations from Democrats. So if that happened, we could end up with the Republicans choosing uh, Donald Trump as president. And that would be, I think, a full-blown constitutional crisis, uh, given that it would happen because of a faithless elector. Under those circumstances, by the way, Carlin, the Senate, just voting as individuals, would choose the vice president. And uh, since right now, uh, although we may end up with two runoffs in Georgia, we don't know yet for Senate seats that could change the outcome, uh, it, it uh, will be a Republican Senate. It will be on uh, January 6th. Uh, the vice president would be there to cast his own vote if it were a tie, but it would uh, end up being Mike Pence, uh, not uh, what Democrats had hoped, a Democratic Senate at that point. Well, let's hope we don't go there. But now let's turn to the House, which you've watched for a very, very long time. Put the House races in historic context. What do we know about them at this point? So Democrats went into this election very bullish on what would happen in the House of Representatives. And remember that uh, Democrats had a great year for the House in 2018. Those midterm contests, they were able to pick up uh, uh, enough seats to have what you could view in this context as a comfortable majority in the House. That meant that they won a whole lot of seats in red districts, districts that had gone for Donald Trump, or districts that were very, very close. And you would have assumed starting uh, this election cycle that they didn't have that many more targets of opportunity. But they thought they might be able to pick up, and some independent observers thought that they could pick up anywhere between 5 and 15 additional seats. We still have a number of contests that are undecided, a number that are very close, but by any standard, you could say that this was a disappointment for Democrats in the House of Representatives. They lost some incumbents, at least a half a dozen, it appears, including a few signature ones, Max Rose in New York, uh, Donna Shalala in, uh, in Florida, which was, uh, uh, I think, a, a shock to an awful lot of people. And they went in didn't, uh, not thinking that they would have that many of their incumbents lose. And they certainly are not going to end up with a more robust majority. Now, one bright spot for them is that a number of the candidates who won in 2018 in very difficult districts, women with national security backgrounds, like Alyssa Slotkin in Michigan, Abigail Spanberger in Virginia, won re-election and actually won it quite handily. So while some of the losses for Democrats were those who were in the more moderate or even conservative wing of the party, Colin Peterson in Minnesota, Max Rose uh, in uh, New York, um, a lot of their newer moderate members, especially women, did quite well. They're gonna keep their majority, obviously, it was a blow to Nancy Pelosi, the speaker. We even have a number of people calling for her to be replaced at this point by um, Hakeem uh, Jeffries. I doubt that that will happen, uh, but it, certainly it was a disappointment. They've got their majority. And the question now, if we have a Biden presidency, is how will that majority respond, given that we're very likely those two potential uh, runoff elections on uh, January 5th in Georgia for the Senate notwithstanding to have divided government, what role will they play with a Biden presidency and a Republican Senate? We should point out that Republican women also had a very good night um, on election night. There are a lot of gains there that are very impressive overall. Norm, will the reduced number of Democrats in the House embolden the progressives? How do you see that playing out? Uh, I, you know, I think we're going to see uh, a, a push by progressives, but uh, Pelosi uh, in the last Congress, in the Congress uh, we're now in, was very, very protective of her uh, moderate members, those who uh, were more vulnerable, the Spanbergers and the Slotkins uh, and the Roses, I might say. Um, and I don't see that changing. Uh, the fact is that the uh, the, the very progressive wing, the wing that is uh, sometimes called the, the squad, the uh, AOC uh, group, is not a significant portion of the Democratic caucus. 
uh, they're still important enough. Every wing uh, is enough to keep a majority from cohering or uniting together. Frankly, I think it would have been a bigger problem if Democrats had won everything, uh, because then you would have had a progressive wing demanding uh, a lot of movement on uh, issues that would have created some fissures within uh, the, the House. If you have a Republican Senate, I think the push to at least set markers down with legislation is going to be uh, something that will unite the members uh, together. And given the challenges that are there uh, in the Senate, I don't think you're going to see deep divisions within the House among the Democrats. But I will give you a caveat there, Carlin. There are at least some reports that are not uh, coming uh, directly from uh, Mitch McConnell himself, that McConnell is going to use the Senate majority's power on the confirmation process to make sure that Joe Biden doesn't get progressives into key policy positions, whether that's the Secretary of the Treasury or uh, the head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. If those nominations get blocked, I think you're going to see a lot of frustration in the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, and that will put pressure on Joe Biden if he's president, but also on uh, Speaker Pelosi if she's um, the speaker. You know, what do you expect to happen in the lame duck? McConnell has sounded somewhat interested in the stimulus. Uh, I would expect that we're going to get a push to do a, a, a stimulus, a COVID recovery package uh, in the lame duck, in part, uh, and again, uh, uh, making an, an assumption that Joe Biden will end up being inaugurated as president on January 20th, and we are still not at that point yet, and we may have uh, a lot of bumps on the road along the way. But if that's the case, McConnell's incentive is to do this while Donald Trump is president, to get credit for the Senate and presumably for Trump, instead of having it wait until January when uh, Joe Biden could have a bigger impact on uh, shaping the package, but also where the credit might go to the new president and more towards the Democratic Party. So I would expect that we will see a reversal in form for McConnell and Senate Republicans on this COVID recovery package uh, during the lame duck. Norm, one other quick question. You followed the money trail in politics for a very long time. Democrats outspent Republicans in contest after contest. Um, how do you see the role of money in this campaign? Well, one place we can look is that we had a staggering sum of money enough money that in the past might have even uh, financed a presidential election in two big Senate races, Kentucky and South Carolina, because Democrats really saw as devil figures Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham. And of course they failed. Uh, now this is, uh, you know, this was not big money. Most of it was small donations. And that's one of the things I'll talk about in a minute, the, the revolution that we're seeing there that may continue in, uh, in some forms and possibly in both parties. But it follows a pattern that we've seen a lot in the past, uh, where we've had uh, multimillionaire candidates uh, running and pouring a lot of their own money into campaigns, and it, it doesn't necessarily move the needle. Money is really important. If you don't get over the threshold of being able to get your message across or being able to get the troops on the ground uh, to get out the vote, you're uh, not going to be able to succeed. But it is a necessary and not sufficient condition to win if there are larger forces out there in the political world. And I think one of the things that we saw in this election is we know that we are driven far more by negative partisanship, by people motivated more to make sure that the other side doesn't gain a victory, that the evil people who will destroy our way of life do not succeed. And those forces really, I think, played a role in a number of these Senate contests where Democrats were very well funded, that includes Iowa, where you might have said under other circumstances that Joni Ernst, who was in a uh, debate where she didn't know the price of commodities, which normally would be an absolute killer in a state like Iowa, still managed to prevail because people weren't looking at the specifics necessarily of candidates pluses and minuses. They were falling back on, we're not gonna let that other side win. And that's what enabled uh, uh, Lindsey Graham and Mitch McConnell, uh, despite having staggering sums of money for their opponents, to prevail quite handily. So it's the caveat about the role of money. Now, having said that, the big factor this time, I believe, was not 
the big money coming from billionaires or from other dark money sources. They certainly played their role in a number of states. But it was that now with the internet and with organizations geared up to be able to get money, if you have motivated voters, Act Blue was this amazingly successful place. It is so easy for people to just go on and have money instantly transferred. And some of them did it every month. And you can bring in large numbers of people. This is a revolution that I would say is significantly greater than what we had uh, when we had direct mail, which was a Republican huge advantage, because it would cost you so much money to send out those mailings and then to process the checks coming in uh, that while you gained from it, it was much less. Now, almost every penny coming in, the vast majority of it goes directly to the candidates and is available immediately. And we're going to see that expanded. And I think we're going to see Republicans pick up on it significantly more in the elections to come. Thank you so much, Norm. And now, Michael, we'll turn to you. And I will start by asking what surprised you most about the Senate races. We certainly saw some polling errors in those Senate contests. Michael. Uh, we certainly did see some polling errors, Carolyn. Uh, in reviewing uh, what I've been saying on Election Watch broad, uh, programs going back in time, um, I found that I did a better job of predicting this year's Senate races back in February than I did in our election watch in September. Uh, back in February, I said that predicted the Democrats were at risk of losing one Senate seat in 2016 Trump state, Alabama. Republicans were at risk of losing two Senate seats, their, their two Senate seats that were in 2016 Clinton states. Um, in the time of uh, straight ticket voting, which Norm adverted to, uh, the votes tend to go uh, down, people, voters tend to go down the line for one party or another, uh, and that the uh, Republicans were at risk of losing seats in Colorado and Maine. I added that Republicans' one chance of another gain was in Michigan, very closely divided in 2016. Uh, and that uh, Democrats might gain an increasingly Democratic Georgia, where a lot of Black voters are moving into the state and casting Democratic votes. That's more or less what happened. I mean, uh, Democrat Doug Jones lost in Alabama, as predicted. Uh, Republican Cory Gardner lost in Colorado. Um, a Republican with a history of underperforming on party lines, Martha McSally, lost in a very close Arizona. Uh, and a Republican with a history of overperforming party lines, doing better than straight party tickets. Susan Collins won in Maine, uh, where she was the first Maine person ever elected to a fifth Senate term. Um, in, in addition, Republican John James came within 2% of winning in Michigan. Um, the, and the two Georgia races, one caused by a vacancy, uh, um, in, with an appointed senator are going into a runoff on early January. So um, basing uh, your predictions on fundamentals and on the basis of previous election returns turns out to be much safer territory than basing them on the polls. And uh, I think that's been true. We've seen that in a couple of Senate cycles. We saw that to some extent in the 2016 presidential race. In 2014, I remember looking at the polling in Kansas and Kentucky, where two veteran Republican senators, uh, Pat Roberts and Mitch McConnell, uh, were showing uh, in great danger of losing. They were, it was a very tight polling contest and so forth. They ended up winning by very solid margins. The pollsters missed those voters that perhaps are culturally conservative, perhaps in rural areas, perhaps strongly Republican, um, perhaps not college educated pollers tend to over uh, sample college educated people and under sample those who are non-college grads. Um, and in fact, that's the same kind of error that we've seen pretty much systematically uh, in this election, and in fact, I think even more so than in 2016. Um, you know, not a single poll all year showed Susan Collins winning in Maine. She won by a solid margin. Only a handful of polls showed uh, McSally behind less than four per the four percent that she lost by in Arizona. Uh, dozens of polls showed Cal Cunningham clobbering Tom Tillis in Iowa, in North Carolina. 
in uh, Teresa Greenfield walloping Joni Ernst in, uh, in Iowa until Ann Seltzer's uh, Des Moines Register poll came out over the weekend. Seltzer has probably the best record in polling in one state and showed uh, Joni Ernst and Donald Trump prevailing in Iowa. So um, I think that there's evidence that the pollsters are missing people. Um, the evidence that the things they told the APOR organization after the 2016, they have failed uh, generally, uh, some more than others, in locating people. And uh, it's, uh, it seems to be an endemic failure in an era when we're no longer, uh, you know, we're no longer in a country where everybody has a landline telephone and people answer the telephone, um, polling technique, polling uh, firms get responses from very much smaller percentage of the people they contact, um, but uh, they're missing certain kinds of people, and uh, they did not show what was happening in this election. I should point out that Michael started his career as a pollster for the legendary Democratic pollster Peter Hart. That was a while ago, but I think uh, some of the problems now may be very difficult to correct. Michael, one quick question here. Um, there's certainly been a high correlation between presidential and Senate outcomes with the exception of Maine. Did we see that again this time? Uh, yeah, we did see that again this time. They were tracking very closely. Uh, that Iowa race, for example, tracking very closely. Uh, Donald Trump and John James both lost by almost identical narrow margins in Michigan. The two Georgia Senate races were very close to the um, presidential race. Uh, Susan Collins is just about the only example of somebody that ran way ahead of her presidential ticket, and uh, and I think we saw this in the uh, we saw this in House races as well. And one of the things this tells me, Carolyn, is that we have moved into an age where that money difference that Norm talked about doesn't make a big difference anymore. Uh, we used to live in a country back when I was a pollster, 1974 to 81, in which everybody had a television set. They watched television every day. There were three networks. Uh, if you bought uh, ads time on television every day, people would see it unless they got up for popcorn or a bathroom break. They would be forced to watch your ad and money made a huge difference. Today, people have all sorts of other options about what they're gonna do and they don't sit still for uh, television ads. So uh, consequently, those huge sums of money, and Michael Bloomberg supposedly spent $100 million uh, in Florida uh, to aid the Democratic ticket. Uh, the Republicans won Florida by the largest margin and a presidential candidate has won Florida since, Republican candidate since 1988. Um, despite $100 million going in the other direction. Uh, money isn't buying you love, and it's not necessarily buying you many votes these days. Um, so we used to be told that money was gonna, you know, people giving large sums of money were gonna take over politics, uh, take over the country. Um, whatever else we're seeing uh, that's going on, that does not seem to be the case. Thank you very much, Michael. I should point out to everyone that you should have two handouts. We're looking at the 2020 races and also looking ahead to 2022 to the Senate and gubernatorial races. And we've given you some basic information about all those contests. And I'm very grateful to have a, just a superb staff to work with, um, Samantha Goldstein, Jackie Clements, and Stephanie Dodd, who helped to put all these together. These were really invaluable. And now, Henry, it's your turn. How permanent is President Trump's grip on the Republican Party after this election? You're muted, Henry. You're muted. I think it, I still don't know. Uh, obviously, the president was able to do something that most pollsters and many inside Republicans didn't think he was able to do. But the fact remains that at the end of the day, President Trump is probably going to lose the popular vote by anywhere between four and 5%. That's not a trivial margin. Uh, at the end of the day, a person who is out of power has much less deference than a person who is in power. And unless something very unusual happens, uh, President-elect Joe Biden will take office on January 20th. He's not yet president-elect, but all of the trends point towards him taking the lead in Pennsylvania and hence winning the presidency sometime later today. 
so the question is going to be how uh, how do the marginal Trump supporters, not the people who will live and die by him, but the people who have supported him largely, respond to him when two things happen. One, he is no longer the president, so they don't have to defend their party by defending him. And two, when since he is no longer president, there are other Republican figures who are coming out to say, you can have everything you like with Trump, but without all of the things that annoy you. Uh, more Trump, less tweet, or uh, you know, new improved Trumpism. Um, my guess is that President Trump's personal brand drops. Uh, been surprised before in politics, uh, God knows, but I'd be a little surprised if the polls that right now say among Republicans, 50% say they're more likely to describe themselves as supportive of Trump, 40% say they're more likely to back the Republican party. This time next year, I'd be very surprised if it hadn't flipped in favor of supporter of the Republican Party simply because of the change in that dynamic. Henry, in our last election watch, you described four factions of the Republican Party that might succeed Donald Trump. Could you go over those again after this election and see who you think gained and lost based on this election? If well, Trump the four there. that I had were, um, and I try and come up with pithy, memorable names. And I think I got it for three of them. Um, uh, maybe four. Uh, the imperial successors, the people who <laughs> will try and be uh, what they perceive Trump to be, mainly an orthodox Republican uh, with a couple of wrinkles. Uh, this is people like Mike Pence, uh, who will say more Trump, less tweet, but define Trump in a way that's not terribly populist. Restorationists, people from, of all stripes, from the movement uh, economic right to the um, hardcore Christian right to the old line business conservative who will basically say, okay, enough of this guy. Doesn't matter that he came close. Doesn't matter that he is getting record numbers of support among uh, non-whites. We just want the old party. We want to sing the old hymns. Um, so these are people who I put like Ted Cruz or Nikki Haley, um, Rob Portman. Uh, then we have the young reformers. Uh, full disclosure, the faction that I am sympathetic to and aligned to, you know, people like Marco Rubio, who basically say, look, the way to take Trumpism seriously is to take it seriously. It wasn't just about his persona, it was about his policies, and uh, we need to build a new coalition that's based on that. And then the fourth is moderate outsiders, um, people like Charlie Baker or Larry Hogan. Um, this is a shrinking group in terms of visible numbers of people, but the fact is, there remain large numbers of moderates who still vote in Republican Party primaries and they send delegates to a national convention. I think it, one, within the party, the, the uh, sweet spot is combining Trumpian populism with movement conservatism. Uh, that is essentially the way Trump governed tough on immigration, tough on nationalism, tough on trade, but not full-blown protectionist, strongly supportive of tax cuts, strongly supportive of deregulation, strongly supportive of religious liberty, but not necessarily Christian nationalism. That's the sweet spot within the Republican Party. I don't think anything has disturbed that. However, the question is whether or not that alone is uh, able to attract the very large number of crossover voters who tend not to be in Republican Party primaries, but do determine elections. The people in the Rio Grande Valley who, re -elect who elected Tony Gonzalez against all expectation. The Cubans who sent Carlos Jimenez and Elvira Maria Salazar in two upsets uh, to win represent South Miami. The white working class voters in the upper Midwest who made it so close. These voters did vote in the 2016 primary for Trump, or at least the white working class did, uh, but they come out in elections. Uh, and I think there the tilt is probably more towards the young reformer, that I think the young reformer is likelier to capture that vote. And the question then is, do Trumpian populists uh, disengage from their de facto alliance within the Republican Party with the old line conservative and uh, switch their allegiance to a young reformer who echoes a lot, but not all of the Trumpian themes and can clearly be demonstrated, I think, to be more attractive in the general election. So, uh, but this is a battle between large factions and a lot of it depends on who emerges and who, how these issues are fought over the next few years. As long as Donald Trump is not in the White House and I feel 
pretty comfortable that he won't be, uh, barring you know, Supreme Court intervention and barring unusual trends in today's ballot counting. Then it'll be a free, open, and fair battle, and we will see which faction prevails. Thanks, Henry. Um, I want to ask you another question. You've been watching populism around the globe, and I wonder how you think this election result fits into what you're seeing abroad. Uh, this is an American version of what happened in 2019 in Britain, with the exception that because of Donald Trump's personality, uh, he lost more of the upper income voters that Boris Johnson was able to keep. I think uh, this is same thing is happening pretty much everywhere. The rural urban divide is not an American phenomena. It is a global phenomena. Almost all of Eastern European populism can be explained by it, that if you live in or near a large city, you vote for a candidate that Berlin and Washington DC like. And if you live outside of it, you vote for a candidate or a party that is derided by those groups. Uh, the same thing is largely happening uh, in, in Britain uh, and uh, happens in Italy uh, and happened in Australia and Canada. So I think what you're seeing is there are forces at work, not impersonal forces, but that people are making decisions based on new issues and new challenges that the old coalitions have difficulty in handling. And you see the old coalitions breaking down. And I wrote an article three years ago, I'd still stand by that it's less left versus right, but in versus out. Do you feel that you are not represented by the bipartisan elite that basically governed the Western world from 1992 to 2008? Or do you feel comfortable in it? If you feel comfortable in it, then people like David Brooks and Bill Kristol are now Democrats. Uh, or as David Brooks said, he is a part of the right word, you know, wing of that uh, party and he feels comfortable there. Well, yes, because basically he and people like him are ins. And then you have people who feel that they are outs, and this can be a multiracial group, uh, but it tends to be a non-college educated group. And they are flocking to a party uh, in, the, in the United States that can attract them. Uh, and so I think that this is continual, continuing evidence that the populist movements are, and the issues behind them are moving. And I would say if in two years, the elites that still tenuously govern most of the world and Joe Biden's election will be a restoration of that elite, if they haven't handled COVID in a way that's putting people back to work, you're gonna see an intensification of populism that will shock Berlin and Washington again, but won't shock me. You know, I'm predicting it, you know, again, if they can't get a situation of COVID where they've got things under control and people are going back to work, People at the lower middle income of all races will move in a populist direction. And the only question then is, will they move to a populist left, like in Ireland or like uh, in, in other countries in Europe, or will they move to a populist right? That is the major challenge of the Biden administration. And we'll see if he and his people are up to it. Henry, one final question for your four factions. Do you have a sense of how large your factions are among the Republican electorate? I am hoping that I will have some hard data on that that will come out sometime next month. I'm in discussions uh, to produce that. I won't say anything more about that. I have a rough sense, but um, I think what we have is that the hard movement conservative group, the alliance between the uh, religious right and the economic right remains strong in the Republican electorate. In a presidential electorate, maybe a quarter to 30%. In congressional electorates, often close to a majority. Uh, the Trumpian uh, segment, uh, the sort of people who came out originally for President Trump, big question is how much will they participate in Republican primaries going forward? Uh, I think uh, they were 10 to 20% in 2016. Their size will do a lot to determine the election of the next president. The somewhat conservatives, the conservatives who uh, I've always said uh, are more like John Boehner conservatives than Ted Cruz conservatives, they remain the largest block in the Republican party, maybe diminished in the 30% range. And then you've got um, people uh, who are uh, moderates uh, who are shrinking, but still not unsizable, uh, 10 to 20% of the electorate. But I hope to have hard data on that uh, coming up soon. Now, oh, thank you for those wonderful presentations. And I wanna give you an opportunity to ask each other questions and then we will turn to questions from the audience. Questions for each other. 
So uh, maybe I'll start. And uh, Henry did mention the word, but uh, until Henry did, no one mentioned the word COVID. And uh, it's interesting, we have this election, um, which arguably some people would say, boy, it looked like it would have without, I actually believe COVID still did have an effect, but it was probably, you know, somewhat marginal and uh, around the edges and, and a Donald Trump without COVID probably would have done a little bit better. And that little bit better might have been helpful in key states, but it wasn't the, the cataclysm that, that one might expect from uh, something that is uh, affecting people's lives, affecting the economy. So the effect of COVID on this election. I would say look to the election of 1930 uh, or look to the first elections, early elections during the Great Depression. Uh, people will stick with their government until the government has proven itself to be incompetent, that uh, we have an election that took place within eight months of the onset of the disaster. Um, it, President Trump didn't do great, but the country's not collapsing. It's just not doing as well as we would have liked. In many of the swing states, unemployment is actually well below the national rate uh, because the economy has been largely reopened. So I think it had less of an impact because COVID is actually having less of an effect uh, on people and they are holding their judgment. You know, is it gonna get worse or is it gonna get better? And until they have a clear direction, they're willing to stick with the party what run them, which is to say partisan Democrats largely moved, uh, thought COVID was worse and supported their party. And Republicans were largely willing to forgive President Trump's missteps and say things will get better uh, with us. The one thing is there has been some evidence that people mentioned in a call I was on yesterday that suggested there was a slight uptick in Hispanics uh, support for Trump as uh, the COVID uh, shutdowns continued. And you saw continued I I difficulty in lowest skilled people going back to work that disproportionately affects them, that the Democrats were saying, well, the death rate disproportionately affects them. Well, the life rate, you know, can we live a life here of security and comfort, or if not comfort, at least not uh, worrying about penury. Uh, that disproportionately affects them too, and that moved them on the margin towards President Trump. Oh, I, let me just I, add. That, uh, uh, I was fascinated that. by the the, the the lineup of opinion on uh, on what we should do, do uh, how much it correlated with party preference. You had, you know, Democrats tend to be in many ways more risk averse uh, and more desirous of lockdowns and other uh, restrictions on movement. Uh, in an attempt to stop the virus. Republicans have tended to be less risk averse and uh, to have uh, more of uh, fewer restrictions. We've seen this in the responses of the governors and there's been, we've really had laboratories of democracy. Uh, Andrew Cuomo, who was widely praised by national media ended up killing a lot of people because he foolishly sent uh, COVID infected people into nursing homes where the risk of death uh, on elderly people is much, much higher, something like hundreds of times higher than it is for people in below 65 age groups. Um, so, uh, you know, the governor of Florida was excoriated by the same media, but the Florida response has been much better uh, in a wide variety of ways. That hasn't correlated completely with party identification, but it has been in that direction. And I think Henry makes an interesting point. What is the long-term effect and the differential effect on people? Um, people in certain kinds of occupations, you're looking, if you're looking at Hispanics being likely to be construction workers, for example, or to work in meatpacking factories, uh, those are concentrations. The meatpacking factories have continued construction work for a while, uh, really uh, has kind of gone downhill. And let's get uh, here. Yeah. So, so, people, so it's, uh, you know, I think there's a real risk that we've gone too far and we will have uh, some backlash on that. Yeah. Norm. So not surprisingly, I have a somewhat different view. Uh, I don't I disagree. I don't disagree at all with Henry. I think he is analysis of what happened in the election is spot on. We are now over 100,000 COVID cases a day. And where we're seeing death rates and the rates of infection soar, the highest, the highest in the world per capita are North Dakota and South Dakota, where the governors basically have opened things up completely. 
the infection rates and the death rates are much greater now in places where we have seen uh, basically no mask requirements. And that includes states where legislators have blocked governors from being able to put them in. And I, what I draw from that is uh, first, I think Anthony Fauci is right that we're headed for a very dark winter um, that uh, as not just flu, but as people are stuck inside uh, that uh, we're gonna see those infection rates go up. We've done a little bit better on the death rates because we are better at treating people, but if they begin to soar, it's gonna get much harder. And the larger point I would make here is we're gonna have great difficulty governing in this area because the response has become a partisan response, a tribal response. And I suspect we're gonna see a very different approach if it's a Biden presidency from the approach of Donald Trump. Uh, it will be an approach where uh, he would lean much more on the Anthony Fauci's than on the Scott Atlases. But the response from the public as a whole is gonna divide along tribal lines. And we're gonna see probably some civil disobedience, some uh, uh, efforts, we'll see the division in the media as well. And it's gonna make for a, a real problem in governing. And that will be particularly true as we move through the winter where a number of the jobs that have been uh, out there as we've opened up, including restaurants that have been able to have outdoor spaces find greater difficulty. We have a lot of questions in the queue. I'm going to start with this one for you, John, from one of our AEI colleagues. Do you think that any of the lawsuits being filed by the Trump campaign are likely to lead to recounts that could affect the razor thin margins that Biden has in some states? John. Well, I, yeah, I, I, I think the answer is no. Uh, and the, the reason is that the, the lawsuits are many and there have been many all along on both sides. We, we've had a record not amount of litigation and some of it is just continuing through now to the post-election period. You know, most of these lawsuits, uh, they may be talked about as if they are big, uh, stop the, all the counting of the vote lawsuits, but they, they tend to be pretty specific things uh, about a specific class of ballots in Pennsylvania, about uh, whether Republicans have access to the counting in places. Uh, I, I don't think the court is going to take up uh, or rule against uh, counting of votes that are already going on in, in massive ways, votes that have already come in well before the election. Now, if we do end up in very close places, uh, if, if Georgia, which looks like it is getting narrower, maybe ends up to be very close, and we are still waiting on the presidency, uh, and that's the key state, of course, we're going to see lots of lawsuits, and they could matter because uh, those those piles of, of votes that we're talking about will be smaller and, and make more sense or, or make more of a difference. Uh, so again, I, I think there is this litigation strategy. I think there's some really interesting questions about a you know a Supreme Court and, and a conservative majority, which might be interested in you know, supporting state legislatures in some way. But I actually don't think we're really going to come to that unless we get further along uh, to a point where we really are close and we're in a a Florida Bush v. Gore situation, then the litigation will really matter. Thanks, John. Norm, this question is for you. Um, President Trump made extensive use of executive actions and orders. Do you expect President Biden to do the same if he's faced with a Republican-controlled Senate? And if so, in what areas? So uh, I, I do think that if uh, there's a failure to uh, come to an agreement uh, in the legislative front in a host of areas, and that'll include health care, of course, um, that the option that would be available to Biden will be executive action. That may be true as well in the appointments area. And remember that one of the things that President Trump has done is to use and abuse the Vacancies Act. Uh, we have, for example, an acting uh, Secretary of Homeland Security and a Deputy Secretary who the courts have said are there illegally because they've gone past the period allowable in the Vacancies Act for somebody who's not been confirmed or nominated for a long time, they weren't nominated for their positions. Uh, that's laying the groundwork for similar actions by Biden if he's not able to get his nominees uh, votes on the floor or confirmed. Now, the caveat here is uh, we have a Supreme Court that is probably poised to greatly curtail executive authority. We have at least five justices who I think are ready to blow up the Chevron doctrine and basically to make a, a very, very difficult for executive agencies to act and promulgate regulations unless they have been specifically uh, directed 
by the legislation that Congress passes. And most of the legislation that Congress passes leaves a lot of leeway for executive agencies. We're going to see probably an attempt to narrow the Commerce Clause to limit what the federal government itself can do. So the ability of uh, Biden to act compared to where Trump has acted on uh, executive power may be very significantly constrained. And that's going to add to the uh, stress level that we have in the uh, uh, tensions across and among branches. This is a question for everyone on the panel or anyone on the panel. In this era of bitter, bitter partisanship, what are the prospects for a constructive relationship on significant matters between McConnell and Biden or some other Republicans in the Senate and Biden? Well, we, we had Biden and McConnell making an agreement uh, on uh, the, when the whole sequester business and budget business was going on in the second uh, uh, Obama administration when Obama, President Obama wasn't able to reach an agreement with anybody. Uh, and was bristling, uh, Biden and, and McConnell uh, got together and reached an agreement. I think we can expect some more things along those lines, but uh, there will be limits on that, uh, given the, uh, you know, the, the importance of the issue concerned and some of the issue and some of the uh, considerations that Norm was talking about uh, in terms of limiting executive action. Um, you know, and we still do get routine bipartisanship in Congress on a number of matters that don't reach headline status, but are nonetheless uh, useful contributions often to public policy. Um, but do I see uh, everybody sitting down at those, uh, you know, proverbial dinner parties and stuff that never really existed in quite the form that is sometimes uh, uh, recalled? Uh, the answer is no. Norm, so, yeah. You know, um, you could go back to the relationship between uh, Lyndon Johnson and Everett Dirksen, uh, where the friendship and the relationship enabled them to do things that uh, often were not necessarily where Everett Dirksen would have wanted them to go. That's long past us. And when Mitch McConnell sat down with Joe Biden, he uh, didn't do it because he had a love for Joe Biden and they got along so well. He did it because he saw it in his own party's interest to cut a deal. And, you know, frankly, he saw it as much better uh, to say, I can't work with Barack Obama. I don't trust him, but I can with Joe Biden. He's a ruthless pragmatist is the, the way I've defined it in the past. And he will find opportunities to work with Biden. But if it's not what he sees in his own and his party's interest, that's not going to happen. One question is what leeway there will be for, say, Mitt Romney, Susan Collins, and Lisa Murkowski to join with Democrats for confirmation or even in some issues to pass things with a majority if Republicans still have that narrow majority in the Senate. But that also is going to depend a great deal on what Mitch McConnell, who has tremendous authority as a majority leader, if he is majority leader, to keep things from coming to the floor or bring them to the floor. If I had to guess, my guess is that on things that are a little bit below the radar, they'll move, they'll be able to make some things happen. Uh, I'm hopeful, frankly, that that will include um, a, a policy reform on mental health. Uh, we could see perhaps some of those things happening. I don't see it happening on the big ticket issues unless there's an enormous uh, public backlash. Henry, do you have any thoughts on that question? Um, you know, I think I would largely agree with Norm. Um, I think a lot of it also has to do with what Joe Biden does, which is that he is somebody who is very comfortable leading from behind. And I don't mean behind in a bad way, I mean behind the scenes. Uh, but he's not ever really had the position he will have as president, which is to lead from in front. And if he's willing to rhetorically and uh, behind the scenes pragmatically lead from a different place than where his party's center might want to be, then uh, I think uh, there might be a slim possibility because then you've got both parties that might see it in their interest to come to something. But that would require him to take a fair amount of um, uh, gaff from his left. It would open up a risk rift within his party because the sort of things he would do need to do to make it in Republicans' interest to go along with him are the sort of things that will make the left go ballistic. And whether Joe Biden is willing to do that on a case-by-case -case basis, 
is another question. Uh, I do think one way to understand Mitch McConnell is through a chess playing metaphor. Mitch McConnell excels at playing black. He loves to let the other side go first and respond. He is poor at playing white. Having Biden in the White House means that the white side going first is going to be the presidency and Mitch McConnell will do what he has done for 14 years as leader. He will let the other side develop their strategy, see if there is weakness to exploit. And if there's not, then he will have to contend with a strong offense. That means Biden's got the initiative and he can decide which direction he wants to govern from. Thanks, Henry. This is a question for the whole panel. What impact will the continuing enormous deficits and growing federal debt to GDP ratio have on the Biden administration and the willingness of congressional Republicans to continue to support such high levels of spending? Yeah, uh, same so effect it's had on the, on, the, uh, on the Trump administration and the Obama administration, not very much. In a period of low interest rates, there's always an argument that says, hey, let's put off any big fixes. Uh, till next year, next term, or next decade? I think that with respect to the deficit, as long as we've got a serious COVID situation, it will and ought to be thrown out the window. The uh, concern needs to be to keep economic activity going. That doesn't mean sending money at everything. As I've written, what we're talking about going forward is a structural problem caused by the restrictions to push back on the disease. Anything where wealth is created by people congregated in close places, or whether it be in an airplane, a hotel, or inside at a restaurant, is going to be suppressed. So what we have to do is figure out how to deal with that, but that's necessarily going to mean more borrowing. And uh, until we get that under control, I think not being concerned about the deficit is the right thing to do and that politically there'll be no problem uh, except among a small group of hardliners on the right who are opportunistically uh, deficit hawks, much as frankly many on the left are, never a problem with deficit spending caused by increased spending, lots of problems with deficit spending caused by tax cuts. Um, I think uh, you'll see a bipartisan consensus to keep the spigots going. Um. And, you know, I, I do think that uh, some of the, of course, some of the more ambitious plans that Biden had uh, prepared for and the strategy, if they took the Senate, uh, I believe, was to use uh, reconciliation on steroids, the one place where they could get uh, uh, something done in an up or down expedited 50 vote fashion and probably to change uh, that rule to enable you to do even more that would have included the Biden tax increase along with very ambitious plans and health policy and infrastructure and COVID recovery and the like. Obviously that's not gonna happen right now. Uh, I think Henry is right, but what we will also see, and it's always quite amusing that we get people uh, going from uh, acceptance of fiscal pro uh, proglyphacy uh, to fiscal conservatism, depending on who's the president um, that uh, we're not gonna see that happen in the, in the immediate term. It will happen a little bit later on. But one place where we might see real action beyond the COVID recovery, I joke a lot that we're in a week 190 of infrastructure week, that we did not see an infrastructure bill um, come out at all. And for reasons that baffle me, the Trump administration never really pushed this. Um, uh, now. I think we're likely to see a bipartisan consensus there. And that will include very possibly compromises where Biden will get some of his push for green jobs uh, and probably for a real serious expansion of high-speed internet around the country. And that'll include rural areas as well as the uh, dead spots in the urban areas. Uh, that's a lot of good high paying jobs um, that we might see that happen. And that's something good in a low interest environment. But a lot of the other things, including expansion in the health policy arena, not going to happen as long as we have divided government. John, this yeah, I, guess I was going to say that uh, I, even on the first question of, of where we might see some cooperation, it is on the, the budget appropriations, COVID, or, or maybe infrastructure, the horse trading money type bills, where the, there is the possibility of some compromise. Uh, I do think, and maybe Henry was implying this, you know, the Republican Party going forward being somewhat more populist is likely to be less concerned with deficits. But I do think in a situation where the president is, is of the other party, assuming Joe Biden's the president, 
that, that there's a there'll be a sense of you know will we're not looking to, to to spend a lot of money and it will be his fault if we don't get a lot and so divided government has tended to lead to a kind of tamping down of at least big expectations big programs and I, I think you will see some of that and some newfound interest in deficits at some point especially as we get past covid uh, maybe not as much as the the more traditional republican party but i still think it will be easy to blame the president uh, rather than uh, the Congress for doing that. John, this is a question for you about key dates going forward um, as we get to January 20th. When do the electors meet and what does that mean? Well, I think even earlier, there are some key dates and that we're gonna, you know, we're still counting even places where we know the result, there will be a certified result at some point. That, that varies, that could be seven days down the road, some states longer time. Uh, if we really are at a point where there is a recount and we're in a Florida situation, yes, a couple key dates come in place. December 14th, the, the electors meet, that is a drop dead date where, where we have to have results and we have to have electors in place. You know, December 8th, the so-called safe harbor date, a few days, six days before that, that's a pretty significant date in particular because of the court in 2000 in Bush v. Gore, which which said, look, state legislatures and especially this, this particular one in Florida wanted to meet that deadline. And you see court, this court being deferential to the, the current scheme. So I, I still think states would want to be safe and get their, their election results in by then. So uh, yeah, I don't think we're going to come to that point. But if we're in a Bush v. Gore situation, I still think December 8th, 8th is a date that we really will want to wrap that up by. Of course, later, uh, Congress counts the vote. A new Congress comes in on January 3rd. Congress counts the votes on the 6th. And then we have, of course, the inauguration and change of term, presidential term at noon. Uh, on, on January 20th. Uh, Carlin, let me just uh, add uh, that, you know, all of this depends on whether we end up with a Biden at uh, what looks to be 270 electoral votes or at 290 or at over 300. At this point, I would say it's more likely to be closer to the latter than to the former. Uh, John Ralston, who's uh, kind of the gold standard reporter for Nevada, says he doesn't see a path at this point for Trump to win Nevada. Uh, and uh, I'm hearing uh, over the last uh, couple of hours before we started from observers of both parties in Georgia that they think that uh, even though it'll be close, that uh, Biden will probably uh, take the lead and win in Georgia. If it's multiple states and we're over that point, I'm not sure these dates are going to matter very much. I don't think we're going to see challenges that will go forward aggressively across four or five states. And then it will be more like what we've seen in past elections. If it's 270 uh, and it all comes down to Pennsylvania, all bets are off. Norm, this question is also for you. What do you expect Biden to do in his first 100 days? And any of the other panelists can take that too. It's a very different first 100 days than if he had a Democratic Senate, or let's put it that way. And we have to keep in mind that if we do end up with two Georgia runoffs, which will take place on January 5th, that uh, that could uh, be at the ball game in terms of uh, control of the Senate. Now, I wouldn't give Democrats great prospects uh, if we'd seen what's happened in the past with runoffs uh, for the Senate in Georgia. Uh, they don't tend to do very well. It's a different electorate. It may be a different time. But let's assume that we have a Biden presidency and a Republican uh, Senate. There's not going to be a big and ambitious legislative agenda unless it is COVID recovery, economic stimulus, infrastructure. Uh, I expect what we will see is an attempt to do a fix in the health care package. And of course, all of that with the caveat of what the Supreme Court does, I'm very skeptical that they're going to throw out the entire Affordable Care Act. But the whole idea of making the fixes to enable it to work where we might get some horse trading, which will likely not include McConnell agreeing to a public option, might be on the agenda as well. Uh, other than that, there just isn't a whole lot you're going to be able to do on the legislative front. And the big question for him is going to be whether he can get his people in place uh, at the cabinet and sub-cabinet level. And I know uh, that with a transition led by Ted Kaufman, who succeeded Biden in the Senate, who wrote the Presidential Transition Act, and with people like Ron Klain high up in his administration, they're going to try to make sure that they get nominees out there very quickly and try and get most of them processed in the first 100 days. That's going to be a top priority. 
Speaking of those people, do you expect to have a Republican in a Biden cabinet? And what about the Elizabeth Warrens at Treasury and Bernie Sanders at Labor? Any expectation of that? Uh, none of that is going to happen. I, I think under these circumstances, you're not likely to see any Democratic senators uh, being chosen for the cabinet. He might try and uh, get Susan Collins or a couple of other Republican senators with states that have Democratic <laughs> governors to accept yeah. <laughs> big positions, um, but they're not likely to accept that uh, either. Uh, you know, where I would expect to see more progressive nominees, and I'll come back to the fact that uh, uh, McConnell may not, might not be happy about that, would be in places like uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or possibly uh, agencies where we've seen it before, like the Department of uh, Labor. But I know one of the names being discussed very much for Treasury Secretary is Roger Ferguson, uh, the head of the of TIAA CREF, uh, who's uh, anything but a uh, fire-breathing uh, ultra-liberal. And uh, I think we're likely to see, uh, for the position of Attorney General, and probably a, a woman of color, uh, but uh, not somebody who would be seen as of the, uh, you know, ultra progressive uh, variety. Uh, you know, we're going to get a mix in the cabinet, but it's going to be some different choices because of the Senate and its confirmation power. You know, Norm, I think that what President Biden should do is uh, go up to a nice restaurant in New York, order some escargot and invite Mitt Romney to discuss the Secretary of State position. <laughs> I don't think that's out of the question. I also think he might invite Dan Coats to come back as the uh, Director of National Intelligence. It wouldn't surprise me that he'll bring in some Republicans like uh, uh, Tom Ridge or others uh, into positions, uh, uh, but, uh, and some will accept. Uh, I don't think that's at all out of the question. Well, I, th I think it's kind of uh, fascinating that the, conf that the Senate uh, is threatening, at least, to uh, try to control the confirmation, use the confirmation process to control the personnel uh, in uh, the direct policy direction that it wants to. I think that's partly because uh, Democratic senators have set a precedent over the years of casting very large numbers of votes against Republican uh, cabinet nominees on substantive positions, which is really contrary to most long-term precedents where they've been relatively routinely uh, approved. Um, and it's, 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 it'll be an interesting exercise in uh, divided government, which I think is one of the big stories of this election. Um, over the last 52 years, since 1968, we've had divided governments in terms of different parties having control of the White House, the majority of the Senate control of the House. 72% uh, of the time. We've only had eight years of, uh, of democratic uh, undivided government trifectas, the first the four years of the Carter administration, the first two years of the Clinton and Obama administrations. We've only had six and a half years of Republican uh, control of those during the first six months and the middle four years of the, um, of the, uh, uh, of, of the, uh, Bush administration and the first two years of the Trump administration. Um, the public uh, doesn't really, see, is very evenly divided, but it seems kind of hesitant about giving either party uh, that much control and has been quite hasty about revoking that control. Uh, that, you know, even the, the longest period of uh, of, of, of government, of undivided government came during the Bush administration, but may have been lengthened by the response to 9-11, which made Bush a very popular president for most of his first term. So um, we, well, I think if we, if Biden, as I think is gonna happen, becomes president and there had been a democratic Senate, I think we would have ended up in, with divided government in 2022 um, we're starting off with it right now and with the prospect perhaps of, uh, of more depending on the races in 2022, which with Biden in office look a little better for the Republicans in the Senate and the House than they did would, I think, if Trump had been elected to a second term. Just to add one little caveat there, uh, in the past when we had a new president coming in and a Senate of the opposite party, 
They didn't block nominees from votes on the floor and they rarely uh, blocked the nominees with floor votes. If we get uh, nominees not even brought to the floor, that would be a very different precedent. Well, we don't, we've never, well, we haven't had presidents in their first term come in without a Senate of the opposite party since I think Grover Cleveland. I know you and I were around then, Norm, but the uh, other panelists weren't. Well, but I, but, but I think I think we we've seen some escalation on confirmation of appointees, as we saw escalation from the Democrats starting off and Republicans following suit on on judges. So here we are. We have one final question before we have to conclude this program, and I save this one to last. Um, if Trump loses, what will he do, and will he run again? I Stump think, the panel. I think if Trump loses, he will have a very rhetorically rambunctious final two months in office. I think he will try and remain relevant on the political stage. And uh, he certainly will not deny an interest in running again, but four years is forever in politics. And he is clearly somebody who uh, is as divisive as anyone in American politics. So I, again, think it is likelier his influence fades rather than rises or maintains itself over time. And that a year from today, we'll be talking less about Donald Trump, private citizen, and more about people who actually hold power. John? Well, I would say that, uh, that I agree with Henry in part that I do think that, that Trump will keep his options open uh, and will flirt with the idea of, of running and, and stay relevant. I think the real inflection point is the midterms. Is he going to be as interested in going forward and, and possibly really help the party in the midterms? You know, a midterm election, which generally the out party does well. Uh, if, if Trump really is serious about it, I think pushing for the midterms or a good Republican result there, you know, then maybe he really is thinking about running for president. So I think the decision point for him is, yes, the first year he'll be interested, but if he really wants to make a push for the midterms and say he's, you know, help the party, uh, you know, then, then he may be on his way to running again. Well, I think he's probably going to live in Mar-a-Lago. I think he's going to want to conduct more rallies or entertainments of that sort, uh, which he clearly enjoys. Uh, he enjoys the spotlight. Uh, you know, I was for running for president. Who ever heard of a 78-year-old man being inaugurated for his first term for president? Uh, Trump will be 78 years old four years from now. So. Um, I think it's I think it's unlikely. Um, I and I think it's unlikely that he campaigns a lot for other people. He likes to campaign for himself uh, and talk about himself and be preoccupied by about himself and uh, and so forth. I will just say something positive about him. He has shown, I think, a certain creativity in spotlighting issues which have not been. Uh, on which the people have not had choices in the past in our presidential elections uh, on immigration and trade. Um, he has had some policy impact in a number of areas, uh, despite his often ham-handed um, attempts at influencing public opinion. And uh, he is, um, you know, as, as I say about uh, a number of people, and you can take this positively or negatively, he is one of a kind. <laughs> Norm, you so, get the final word. Uh, so first, a, a caveat. Uh, don't forget that the New York Attorney General and the New York uh, City DA have opened uh, significant investigations into issues involving his pre-presidential period. I'm going to watch how he uses the pardon power during a, a transition, but that's a headache that he may have to cope with. Beyond that, I really do expect, Michael is right, he's going to hold lots of rallies. I expect to see a Trump media network, um, one that will involve television and uh, radio, talk radio, and probably social media, that uh, he may bring over uh, some of the people who have been very supportive of him, like Lou Dobbs, uh, maybe add uh, figures like Mark Levin to his network and position it to the populist right of Fox. And uh, that uh, could be a very, very interesting dynamic for our discourse uh, looking ahead. 
And on that note, I want to thank all of you for joining us and thank especially my panelists who are just simply the best in the business to talk about elections overall. Thank you all so much.